Action. <laughs> I'm expecting action. Oh, yeah. I, I have the unique privilege this morning of enjoying a conversation with my uh, very dear friend and teacher, Professor, Professor Richard von Prague uh, of Harvard. Uh, Dr. von Prague, uh, for many, many years, uh, the professor of uh, cardiovascular pathology and the director of the uh, registry at the Children's Hospital Boston, uh, which was a particular uh, section of the overall resources at the Children's Hospital that contributed enormously uh, to generations of uh, pediatric cardiac mm -hmm. surgeons. Uh, but Dr. Von Prague, what I'd like to talk to you about in starting out is I'd like to turn the clock back uh, really to the earliest days uh, of the evolution of surgery for congenital heart disease. And uh, of course, we know the very first closed operations were done in the late 1930s and then uh, shunt operations in the 1940s. But what I, what I want to ask you about is the transition uh, by which surgeons became practitioners who changed the structures within the heart, what we mm -hmm. refer to today, of course, mm -hmm. as open heart surgery. Now, my impression is that when this took place in the 1950s, these pioneer individuals whom we think of today as cardiac surgeons, mm -hmm. they were in fact simply surgeons. Mm -hmm. right. uh, some of them concentrated on surgery of the chest, mm -hmm. which meant that they took a great interest in removing cancerous lungs and mm -hmm. dealing with obstructions in the esophagus. But as many of them were surgeons who repaired hernias, and excised thyroid glands, and even fixed broken bones. What was the process by which the best and the brightest of this population of general surgeons eventually came to at least be curious, and at best know enough to deal with rearranging the structures inside the abnormally malformed heart? Well, that's, that's a marvelous question. Um, I would, uh, I would take us back to August 26, 1938, when uh, the surgical chief resident at Children's Hospital in Boston, a, a young Robert E. Gross, uh, tied off the first ductus arteriosus uh, in a seven and a half year old uh, young lady uh, by the name of um, uh, Sweeney. Uh, Lorraine Sweeney, and um, the how did how in the world did that happen? That the the chief resident uh, <laughs> managed to open a whole new field of cardiac surgery. Well, first of all, his chief, Professor Ladd, was out of town, and that was very important. And uh, the story, the uh, story, which may be in part apocryphal, but I know people who will swear it's true. Uh, you see, uh, uh, what had happened previously to this was that um, for three years, Bob Gross had spent uh, a, a lot of time in the pathology lab. And he was in fact a, uh, an instructor in pathology at Harvard Medical School. And he became a, a dear friend of Bert Wolbach who was the person who founded the uh, Department of uh, Pathology at Children's Hospital Boston in uh, about 1914. And uh, Wolbach's claim to fame was really as a microbiologist. He discovered uh, the, uh, the agent of uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, for example. And uh, Bob Gross and Wolbach became close friends. They actually went horseback riding on Sunday morning when they spent a lot of time uh, in the pathology lab uh, trying to figure out uh, how to tie off a ductus arteriosus. And a young uh, pediatrician by the name of John Hubbard was also very important uh, in this. And so they had basically, uh, between the dog lab and the pathology lab, they had figured out uh, Gross and, and Hubbard but mostly Bob Gross, I think, had figured out how to uh, tie off a ductus arteriosus. And then uh, when uh, Professor Ladd went on his summer holidays late August 1938 with the war clouds gathering over Europe, um, 
he told his young chief resident, uh, uh, R.E.G., as we called him, uh, don't do anything too, too, too exciting, too interesting uh, while I'm away. <laughs>